Welcome to Unlocking Science. Our goal is to glorify God by studying and unlocking the secrets of His amazing creation. I'm your host, Mr. P, and we're out again in Johnson Observatory, and I'm joined by Dr. Danny Faulkner. Now, we did an episode a little while back on the phases of the moon, and we talked about how the different phases of the moon work with the position of the earth and the sun and the moon and how those pieces fit together. So today is one of our hands-on episodes. So we're going to teach you a technique to be able to measure some things about the moon and actually map it. So mapping the moon is our episode today. And we're going to look at some tools that we've got here on the table and think about the different phases of the moon. So how long have you been studying the moon? <laughs> Over a half century. I got my first telescope around 1967, I think. Mm -hmm. And I... Um, used one of the first things I looked at was the moon through that telescope. Of course, because so, it's big and easy to find up in the sky. Mm -hmm. Unlike other things, they're not so easy to find. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what you're looking for usually, yes. but the moon's hard to miss. Now, do you have to have any special tools to be able to observe the moon and look at it? No, you can uh, see a lot on the moon with just, with just the naked eye. I remember back when I was in probably third grade or so, my sister encouraged me to look at the moon and draw some pictures of it. I, I wish I would have kept those, and, but uh, that was like in 1963. And so I, um, I made some drawings of the moon way back then, the light and dark areas. I mean, nearly a full moon, and that helps. But um, you can do your naked eye, the binoculars. You have some binoculars there. Yeah, Those are so nice. It doesn't take a big, fancy telescope or anything, or even big, fancy binoculars. This is just a basic 10, uh, 10 by 42. So this is a 10 power magnification. It's going to give us roughly 10 times the size. And these are a 42 millimeter objective lens. Now you can get larger objectives up and to smaller and, and even smaller. So what's the difference between a larger and a smaller objective, basically? Uh, uh, larger objectives will get you more light and things will look brighter. With the moon, you don't need a lot of light because it's already bright. It's got lots of light. If you have a big pair of binoculars, it can actually almost burn a hole in your retina. It seems like it's just over yeah, bright sometimes. you want to be careful with so that. So any binoculars will give you a better view. Mm -hmm. If you have a small telescope, give it a try. It, it, uh, it's going to look better than it would without without the telescope. Yeah. And especially around if you've got the, the shadow part, if you're looking at a crescent or a gibbous phase or around the perimeters, you can see things a little better. That's where the craters show up yeah. right. along that They're terminator. They're washed out. Yeah. yeah, so something like this. These are just my hunting binoculars, but they work great for simple observations like that. So mapping the moon doesn't take anything fancy <clears throat> or, or crazy. Now, down in the description of this video, you'll find a link to the PDF that has all the instructions for this activity. So this is going to take into account a long period of time because how long does the moon take to go through a full cycle? Uh, a month, uh, more specifically, the, the phases are 29 and a half days. Mm -hmm. And what we're going to recommend is you do the first half of the cycle because it's up in the evening sky. If you want to see the other half, you get to get up and early in the morning. Yes. But uh, we want to, want, you, want you to start right after new moon. New moon, you can't see it. We did the phases before. The new moon's like this, and it's uh, too dark to, to see the moon. But then a couple of days after new moon, you'll see that thin crescent in the sky. It'll be lit up on the, on the right like that. Mm -hmm. And then uh, each day it will get more and more first quarter and then finally wax and gibbous and finally full phase. Okay. So we've got a worksheet laid out for you where you can actually be mapping these things out. So each night you're going to go out at the same time. That's important. And you're going to sketch the shape of the moon onto the circles that we've got laid out in the, on the uh, worksheet for you. And then you're going to record some other things. So we definitely want to know the date. We want to know the time. And then you can even record some other things like moonrise and moonset. Now, you're probably not going to be up at the time when the moon <laughs> rises and when it sets to be able to record those things. So there are lots of online tools yep. that you can use to find those things. We'll have a link to one of the websites that's got you, some you good just, information. You put in your location and you put in the mm -hmm. date and it will tell you when moonrise and moonset are. Yeah, a lot of weather apps that you might use on your, uh, your parents might have on your cell phone. They would give you the moonrise, moonset, sunrise, sunset, lots of information like that. So that's easy to find information. And then this is the hands-on part where we're actually going to have you build a tool. Now this tool, again, doesn't take anything fancy, just some simple things that you have around the house. And this is basically um, a sextant. It's a mm -hmm. way that we measure degrees of elevation above the, the surface of the horizon. So we all recognize this device. This is a protractor that you can you probably have laying around the house. You can find very inexpensively. And this protractor, this protractor, you notice has a little tiny hole right up here. And I've attached a piece of thread or string. So you'll need some of that. And you'll need just a regular drinking straw. 
and some type of weight. Now, something like a nut or a washer will work great for this activity. Uh, the heavier, the better, but we don't want to get it too big. So something that'll bring the string down straight down. Like and, this. and the reason why a washer or a nut is good is because it's symmetrical. If you put a nail or something, it's going to skew the, the line. It won't be yeah. vertical. So I like washers and nuts are perfect for this. Mm -hmm. Now we want to we want to get all these hanging down. Now this would we'd call this something like a clinometer or an inclinometer because it's going to give us inclination. And notice as we're rotating our little devices, the string is going to be hanging straight down. Why does that happen, Dr. Faulkner? Gravity. <laughs> gravity. <laughs> so gravity is always pulling this weight down toward the center of the earth. And as I rotate this and I move this, this string is gonna stay in a straight line because of gravity. Now I could swing it and make it move, but if we just hold this relatively still and tip it, we can see those things rotating with it. And when you're making your measurements, it's, held, it's good to kind of hold it in place and then let it go to, to uh, reach that plum vertical. Mm -hmm. um, if it swings a little bit, just wait until it stops swinging. Yeah. So what we're going to do here is we're going to find altitude above the horizon, and that's an angular measurement. Yep. Okay? Altitude is, a, is how far up from the horizon you are, so you want to put an angle. Yep. You can estimate these, but this is a better way of getting it. Imagine you point horizontally with one hand and you point your other hand up like this, then it's the angle between those two arms. If something's on the horizon, it's zero degrees. If it's at the zenith, that's the point directly overhead, that's 90 degrees. If it's halfway up, it's 45. One third of the way up, it's 30. Two thirds, mm -hmm. it's 60. And you can estimate those really reasonably well. Yeah. But this will allow you to measure it pretty, pretty accurately, okay. actually. So simple. All I've done is I've taped this with some, some clear tape. Now, you've used duct tape because all real the men, men Real use men duct use duct tape, tape yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's a very simple construction, nothing fancy. So when I use this tool, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the straw as my sighting aid. And I'm actually going to look through the straw up at the moon. And I'm going to let that string get to it to where it's holding still. Line up the moon. Might have somebody help you with this. And then I'm going to pinch the string so that I've got the string right where it was. All right. So now this will be my measurement across here. And I can use this line to actually get my measurement. Now, this is gonna read, most protect, protractors will have both sets of angles away from 90 and away from 180. So which angle are we gonna be looking for to read <laughs> on this protractor? <laughs> this is where it gets a little tricky. We're gonna have yeah. to do some math. Well, I prefer to go with a smaller angle, mm -hmm. but then even that's not right because if you have it horizontal, it will read 90. And if you have it at the zenith, it will read zero. And so when you do that, you want to take what we call the complement of that angle, okay. which is a fancy word that says subtract it from 90. Okay. So if your reading is 40 degrees on the protractor, the altitude is actually 50. Mm -hmm. If the reading is 30, then it's actually 60 and so forth. Yeah. The other way, if I read this from the large angle, mm -hmm. this one is, oh no, our sign just <laughs> fell over with a little gust of wind. I'll get that. Um, the other angle that I read here, if I read this at about 109, we can think of that as an absolute difference. So if it's 109, that means it's 19 degrees away from 90. So my altitude would be 19 degrees. So you subtract 90 from that. Yeah, so we're finding an absolute difference away from 90, whether you've got a smaller number or a larger yeah. number, just subtract the, use the bigger one and subtract out the smaller one. You think somebody would make protractors that you could use for astronomy, right? <laughs> well, they are, they're called sextants. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> the fancy tool for those things. Okay, so- by, by the way, I tested this last Last night I made mine yesterday, and uh, last night I went out and I measured uh, the, the moon wasn't out, but I measured some stars, mm -hmm. and I measured Polaris, and the angle I got was 40 degrees. I wasn't biasing this; I just what's the measurement? Turns out where I live, the expected value is 39 or 40 degrees. Okay, so Polaris is the North Star. Yeah, so it mm -hmm. should be 39 or 40 for me, depending on well, there's a couple of reasons why it varies a little bit, but I got 40, mm -hmm. which means that. I'm within the, the variance of what the right value is supposed to be. It's a pretty good tool. So you if, you, if you're careful, accurate. you can get really good accurate mm -hmm. results. All right. So that's one measurement you're going to record. You're going to record the altitude above the horizon. The second one's a little more complicated. Yeah. It's called the azimuth or azimuth. Now, for this, you're going to need a compass like this one or like this one that don't just tell us where north and south are, but they actually have this ring around the outside edge. So if you notice, this ring actually has 
the degrees and in a circle there are 360 degrees. Now that's my boyhood uh, Boy Scout compass so it's got a little air bubble in it because it's a little old so it's not going to give us a super accurate reading. But what we're going to do here and all the instructions are laid out in the in the worksheet that you can download. We're going to line up this needle with north and we're going to orient this arrow, our bearing arrow, toward the moon. Now if you aim it toward the moon it's going to be up at an angle and the compass isn't work, going to work well. So what you'll need to do is think about where the moon is and then off in the horizon pick an object that's directly below the moon, set your compass flat and point that compass right toward the moon and where that object lines up right below the center of the moon and then you're going to rotate this dial till that needles inside what we call the dog house or the shed so everything's lining up the north arrow and you're going to take a bearing or a reading off of here that'll give you the degrees around the horizontal plane of the earth mm -hmm. um, have you tried this using a simple compass like this i have usually i try to estimate them i'm pretty good at that because mm -hmm. i i know which way direction north is and i can put north put my arm out and kind of estimate it but a, <laughs> but a compass will, will do even better for you, mm -hmm. you the uh, the markings you have here zero to 360 that actually is the azimuth yep and i'll give you a little hint uh, when you start doing this <clears throat> if you do it the next next week for instance or a few days when we have a new moon starting on the 20th Probably on the 22nd, you can first see so the moon. that's July 20th, July 20th. 2020. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can go out probably a night or two later, and you'll see the moon very low in the, in the western sky. And the azimuth ought to be close to 270. Uh, it might be 280, somewhere around there. But it's going to be close to 270. That'll be west. And over the course of the two weeks, you will see at first the altitude will increase for a while. Then it'll decrease. And the azimuth will decrease. You'll go from 270 to 240 to 230 to 220, all the way around. And when you get finished, you'll probably end up around uh, azimuth close to, uh, probably close to uh, uh, 90 to 110 degrees, I'm going to guess. Yeah, so you're going to be tracking the movement of the sky. Now, if you don't have access to a compass like this, again, this is a value that you could look up on an online site and record some of those things. Or the first night you do it, you can check your reading to make sure you're yep. getting a fairly accurate reading and then take those readings from there. Mm -hmm. and, and the most important thing on azimuth is, uh, I, I used to have my students do this, uh, I would have them get the direction to north, and what if your direction is off a little bit? Instead of being north this way, it's off that, that direction a little bit. What's well, okay if you have the same direction be north every time, as long as it's not way off, you, you're going to see a change each night. That's what's important. Now, what you don't want to do is say north is this direction one night and the next night it's that direction. That's not good. If you're off a little bit, be consistently off because yeah. the important thing is the difference you see from night to night to night. You should see the azimuth continually decrease over the two weeks. The altitude will increase and then decrease, but the azimuth will always decrease. Yeah. Another way that you can do a very similar activity is to take a camera and set it up on a tripod, maybe mark the ground, maybe you've got a, a spot in a, a grassy field, you can put some flags down where the tripod would sit, get it at the same height every night, all of these things. You could line up some object like the edge of a tree on the right side of the camera, and you could take a series of photos. You've done something similar to that with the comet that we're seeing right now in yep. the sky, Comet Neowise. And then you can watch that image move if you were to lay those out and put them into a, a program that would make type of a, a slideshow with it. You could actually watch the, the moon moving through the sky and those different And I've, I've done that with the moon a few times. I was doing a project a couple of years ago and I took the picture of the moon uh, on several mornings in a row and it was marching right to right left as I was looking at it. Yeah, it's going west to east in the sky, decreasing as a move. Mm -hmm. Another uh, uh, important thing is the uh, as a, again, you want to find that difference each time. And if you miss this next new moon, it's the 20th of July. Or if you want to do it again, the next uh, new moon will be on the 18th of August. So a day or two later, a night or two later, you should be able to do it again. After that, if you want to do this some more, I suggest you just check an almanac or a calendar might have it. Or you can even get online and say, when's the next new moon? Yeah. Usually a night or two after new moon, you should be able to see it. The yeah. moon will be invisible for two or three days around new moon, but after that it should be easy. If the weather's good, you can do this almost every night for two weeks. All right, so we're going to be mapping the moon, taking good, careful observations, drawing some nice images there, trying to be as careful as you can. You don't have to indicate every crater, but we're going to go through those, those different phases from that waxing crescent to um, in through those quarters. You can label all those pieces, see all those things. 
record all of this information and you're basically doing what a standard scientist would be doing analyzing all of these different pieces and watching this motion mm -hmm. yep. and all of this again is to help us understand how god has made an orderly system for the moon to move around the earth all the different things that we talked about in that episode about how it helps stabilize our oceans and temperatures and the seasons that it helps us indicate as we see in genesis 1 uh, all those things are ways that we can glorify god and understand and study those things all right, we hope you enjoy this activity. Get to get out and see God's amazing creation, the moon. And until we see you next time, do that. Get out and explore and enjoy all of God's amazing creation.